Good afternoon, everyone. I am Joshua Miguel Sanchez, the VP for External Affairs of the Graduate Student Council, College of Liberal Arts. Welcome to plenary session two of the 14th DLSU Arts Congress. This afternoon's plenary session is entitled Governance in Pandemic Times. Before we formally begin today's plenary session, kindly keep in mind the following reminders. To prevent internet connection traffic, we request our dear audience to please keep our microphones and video cameras off during the session. For our question and answer portion later, we shall be using the Slido. All questions addressed to our speakers should be typed in Slido. You can access Slido either by scanning the QR code flashed on the screen or by clicking the Slido link provided in the Zoom chat box. Our faculty moderator will be the one to read for us the questions for the audience. Keeping in mind those reminders, we shall now begin this afternoon's plenary session. To moderate our session, we have with us Dr. Eric Vincent Battaglia, full professor from the Political Science Department. Good afternoon, Dr. Battaglia. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Joshua. Um, good afternoon and welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Eric Battaglia. I'll be chairing this panel entitled uh, Governance in Pandemic Times. So the COVID-19 pandemic has produced serious governance challenges the world over. It has exposed the strengths and weaknesses of governance systems and leadership decision-making in many countries, whether rich or poor, developed or less developed. Last year's successes and failures put into question the quality of government intervention and decision-making. Indeed, it is the quality of intervention that is critical to minimizing the costs of the pandemic to economy and society. So some questions arise from our experience. How are relevant uh, pandemic control information generated and used for policy making? How do different types of lockdowns affect the economy and COVID-19 morbidity and mortality rates? What kind of logic was behind lockdown decisions in the Philippines and other Asian countries? Was securitization of the pandemic necessary in the Philippines? How have local governments and the private sector responded in view of lacking national government capacities? What are the implications of the continuing pandemic governance on the forthcoming Philippine national elections? These and other questions shall be examined and addressed by our panel members. We have six uh, papers to be presented today. Three will look at the pandemic governance from a comparative perspective. So that's part one. Uh, part two will uh, be focusing on pandemic governance in the Philippines. In the first part, which deals with the comparatives. Dr. Ayame Suzuki, Associate Professor of Political Science at Dosisha University in Kyoto and Visiting Professor at De La Salle University's uh, Political Science Department, will examine the different state responses in East Asia and uh, explain varying levels of state effectiveness in dealing with the pandemic. The title of her paper is State's Capacity and Scope Do Matter, Case Study of COVID-19 Responses of Selected East Asian Countries. I will follow Dr. Suzuki's uh, presentation and in my paper, Hard and Soft, Partial and Broad Lockdowns and Their Impact on Selected uh, Southeast Asian Countries. I will compare the responses of Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines, showing the trade-offs experience when instituting certain types of lockdowns. 
in the same vein, the paper entitled The uh, Policy Illogic of the Philippine Government's uh, COVID-19 Response will be presented by Dr. J.J. Joaquin of the Philosophy Department. And the paper attempts to unravel the logic behind the government's response to the pandemic, comparing this with other countries in the region. The paper is the result of a collaborative work, and I heard it's going to be published somewhere, uh, with Dr. Ador Torneo, full professor of the Political Science Department and executive director of the La Salle Institute of Governance. Along with our junior colleagues in the department, uh, Michelle Santa Romana and Kevin Nielsen Agoho. Going to part two, um, pandemic governance in the Philippines, our chair, Dr. Sherwin Ona, you know, takes on the securitization of the pandemic in the Philippines as he presents his paper, Securitization of the Pandemic, an Exploratory Study of COVID-19 uh, in the Philippines and its implications for, for policy development. Next, we have our illustrious and esteemed colleague at the department, Dr. Francisco Magno, you know, who will uh, present his paper entitled Co-Production Mechanisms in Pandemic Governance. Here he will tackle local collaboration in pandemic governance, emphasizing the co-production of public goods for the containment of COVID-19. I think this is for the city of Manila. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Finally, we have um, Associate Professor of Political Science and uh, former Executive Director of Transparency International Philippines, Dr. Cleo Kalimbahin who will present her paper um, entitled Reality of a Long COVID Elections During a Pandemic. Here, she will examine the implications of the continu continuing pandemic governance on the 22, 2022 national elections. Now, given the constraints of having six papers uh, presented in an allotted period of 1.5 hours. All presentations will be made uh, for a maximum of 15 minutes. Now, after the presentations, if we still have time, then we can entertain a few more questions. So without further ado, Dr. Suzuki, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Patalia. Uh, may I share my screen? Here. Now, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank De La Salle University for having me as a visiting professor for two years. I also want to thank Professor Patalia for allowing me to uh, present my paper in this fantastic panel. Now, um, this study is a part of my book project on the state capacity and scope in ASEAN five countries. For this particular presentation, I intend to describe varieties of state response to the pandemic, identify the scope of the state and determine the capacity of the state in selected ASEAN countries. For this purpose, I will provide some uh, selected indicators for cross-national cross comparison and case study from Malaysia. Uh, first of all, let me briefly talk about scope and capacity. Scope refers to the function or the purpose of the state. According to Francis Fukuyama, the minimum scope includes provision of public goods such as defense and public health, and more active function of the state includes industrial policy and other things. In the context of um, pandemic, the minimum level of scope includes health administration such as tracing, testing, isolation and treatment, and income compensation for the poor, and more active active role of the state includes stimulus package and other measures. We also need to identify the targets as well. Does the government measure only target the poor or does it include the middle income groups, SMEs, big businesses and other groups such as women and migrants? Let us look at the capacity now. The state capacity has several aspects, one of which is coercive capacity. Mm -hmm. 
defined as an ability of state leaders to get people in the society to do what they want them to do. Equally important is the concepts like embedded autonomy, uh, which refers to the state's ability to remain autonomous in making decisions, while be in a constant exchange with the private sector to get the consent and cooperation. So now we have well-defined concepts. We can list down some of the research questions. For the scope, has the government secured the minimum health administration? Is the government prepared to mitigate the economic impact of the pandemic? Is the government playing an active role in supporting the industries? Who are the beneficiaries for the measures? And for the capacity, has the government been able to impose its rules on the people and the businesses? Has the government been able to make decisions and implement them autonom autonomously? And has the government effectively communicated with the society? Now, let us look at some of the indicators. This table shows the cumulative cases, recovered cases, death, and testing in seven East Asian countries. Let us look at Singapore. You may notice a very high recovery rate here and a significantly low death rate. Uh, to a lesser extent, Malaysia actually enjoys relatively low death rate as well. One of the explanations for this may be testing. If you look at the uh, Singapore's per million population testing, it's massive, 1.3 million. Uh, Malaysia, of course, has much smaller number compared to Singapore, but still compared to Philippines or Indonesia, it's much bigger. And then the positive, uh, positivity rate in Singapore and Malaysia are also lower. What about fiscal response? This table shows the amount of anti-COVID fiscal uh, packages and the percentage of GDP in respective countries. If you look at the per capita, this is the most interesting, you notice uh, the enormous difference among the states. Now, what are the purposes of these fiscal measures? For instance, in Malaysia, a significant proportion go to liquidity support, credit creation, long-term lending. These are basically catering to the industrial sector. On the other hand, the Philippines, uh, health and income support is for the biggest item in the fiscal measure. Um, same trend can be seen. Same, can, same trend can be seen. Uh, let me stop this first <laughs> because I just got gathered that it's a presenter's view and my notes are shown. Okay, here. Uh, the same trend can be seen in the breakdown of the health and it, mm, what the heck? Uh, same trend can be seen in the breakdown of health and income support. In Malaysia, only 6%. Uh, I cannot do anything. Uh, let me continue. So in, in Malaysia, only 6 I, Okay, only 6% goes to the health sector, where it's 45% uh, go to the subsidy for individuals and households, 28% goes to the business. Let us look at the Philippines, 57% go to health sector. The income, uh, the individual household get, uh, gets 19% from this item as subsidy, but there is no subsidy to the businesses. I think the same inference can be drawn from the text mining. Uh, can I stop sharing first? Uh, I will redo the sharing again so that you don't have to see my notes anymore. Hmm. No. I <laughs> the same inference can be drawn from text mining. Uh, this is a pilot project. Uh, of course, th this is a President Duterte's speech from March 13 to April 6, and he talks about people, trabajo, etc. But the significant proportion goes to like police, police, uh, and then sundalo, order, captain. So we can say that the Duterte's risk communication is pretty much skewed toward coercive. Uh, power of the state. Now, this is uh, Li Xianlong's speech, uh, word cloud. You can see that the, his speech revolves around the livelihood of the people. And now this is Malaysian Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin. 
he talks more about the economy, but more about the uh, private sector, like entrepreneurs, SMEs, etc. Now, uh, so Duterte, President Duterte basically says that the state coercive power is very important, but is coercion really an effective way to deal with COVID-19? This chart plots the uh, death per million on y-axis and uh, maximum government stringency on the x-axis. It's uh, pretty much skewed. So I will scale the y-axis. This is death per million and this is government stringency. And now we can see the differences among the ASEAN countries. If you look at the Philippines, Philippines has the maximum, uh, the highest maximum stringency rate, but it also has the second highest death per million in the region. A very simple regression of death per million population and government stringency shows that there is a positive relationship that means more death, um, more stringency, more death. So it might be the case that the stringency may not translate to a lower debt. Now this chart visualizes the government stringency index and the daily new cases in Singapore. The red is stringency and then the blue is the daily cases. If you look at the right side, this is uh, uh, the duration uh, before and during and then after the circuit breaker in the, uh, in the Singapore. You can see a clear downward trend here but this, uh, if you look at the Philippines, the, there is no, it's actually going up, upward. And then uh, Malaysia is very interesting because there are two, in, uh, two peaks in terms of stringency. The chart on the right side is the movement control order, which is well, kind of relaxed version of ECQ, but the highest stringency in Malaysia. And during this, first MCO period, there is a downward trend. The second MCO, there is upward trend. And then you can see after February, the case declined, but this might be due to the changing testing policy of the country. The government decided not to test the asymptomatic close contact. So we've seen several indicators, but what about autonomy, the embedded autonomy? To approach this, we need a process tracing. Uh, I'd like to highlight Malaysia's case here. There are basically three waves in Malaysia. The first wave comes from imported cases and second wave started with a religious gathering called Sri Putalin Cluster. And at the same time, Malaysia also experienced a political crisis that started from the Sheraton move where a part of the a member of the governing coalition, then governing coalition conspired with the opposition party members to topple uh, Mahathir's government. And then they succeeded and Muhyiddin Yassin was sworn in as a prime minister, but the government was called as backdoor government. Now, um, the Sri Putalin cluster increased. So the Ministry of Health had to do something, but for weeks, the Ministry of Health didn't even have the ministers. So basically the pandemic response at this time was mainly organized by the bureaucrats. And in mid-March, the government declared MCO. And at the same time, the Minister of Health did a rigorous contact tracing and then they succeeded in bringing down the cases. A few months after the first MCO, Malaysia basically enjoyed a period where there are very limited number of cases and most of the cases came from foreign workers. But the situation changed drastically after the Sabah state election in September 16, uh, 26. And this election was very important for Mihidin because basically he needed a democratic legitimacy. And then also he was facing the losing of majority in the parliament. So he had to, he had to prove that he can actually win the people's hearts and minds. So no, massive number of political campaigners and members of parliament went into Sabah. At the time, Sabah already had numbers of clusters. So basically these people went into Sabah and then spread the virus within Sabah and then bring back the virus out of Sabah to respective hometowns. So that explains this uh, increase in cases. In addition to it, from November, there was a foreign workers uh, cases. Also, this is also massive. So eventually in January, the, the government declared the second NCO. Now, uh, what I want to highlight here is that the first MCO and the second MCO are two different things. The first MCO, all the non-essential sectors were ordered to close. 
But the second MCO, as it's written in this red, numbers of uh, sectors were allowed to open, including the manufacturing sector. And the manufacturing sector at the time accounted for about 30 to 60 percent of whole cases. So it's surprising. It, is a, it was a surprising decision. But the government decided to sow. The reason, the, the factor behind it, it's really the pressure coming from the private sector, including the Federation of Manufacturers uh, Malaysia. So the government decided to keep manufacturing sector open. Of course, other sectors stood up and say, hey, what about us? So in mid-January, Barber's Association said something, and then also Night Market Traders Association also said something. Then the government had to open these sectors. And then the same episode followed. What's interesting is that this uh, series of opening happened in the midst of this sharp increase in active as well as daily cases. This episode suggests the inadequacy of the Mohidin government to make autonomous decisions. And it also shows the lack of communication between the state and private sector. And there is a very big difference between Malaysia and Singapore in here, because in, in Singapore, when there is an important decision made about the economic sector, there's always this dialogue between ministries and the industrial groups. Now, there is another episode that shows the lack of embedded autonomy. As I have already said, the majority of case came from, uh, comes still now, comes from the foreign workers. Uh, and the government, of course, knew about it. Then the government, in fact, had taken several actions in as early, as early as May. For instance, on May 8, the Ministry of Public Works made it clear that the foreign workers had to take swab tests before going back to workplace. In spite of it, the actual number of foreigners who, who took the test was really so limited. Uh, obviously, there was a non-compliance on the part of the private private sector, and then why it was so? Because government at the time made it clear that they did not shoulder the whole cost of testing; it shouldered only a part of it. So the businesses found it very expensive to to do the test, and then also at the same time, it was uh, uh, argued that the government did not consult with the private sector before making this decision. So what can we say, what conclusion can we draw from this Malaysian case? Uh, generally speaking, the Malaysia state scope is very wide, as we saw in several indicators. But the scope, at the same time, excluded foreign workers, and that, ha that had a very big consequences later on. And on the state capacity, we know that the Health Ministry of Malaysia is quite competent. They could at least bring down the cases during the first MCO. But the absence of political leadership was a contributing factor here. Toward the latter half of the year, the political expediency dominated the health, health administration, and the Sabah election no doubt contributed to the spike of the case. So the government, without embedded autonomy, also had to make repeated concessions to the private sector on number of regulations. The malleability of the current administration can be explained by the vulnerability of the administration in the sense that it lacks democratic uh, democratic legitimacy and then also it lacks internal support. I think this latter part is really important. Uh, even a competent state with very high state capacity can fail uh, once it is captured by the political power. How to make the state free from political meddling and work for the well-being of the people? This is a very big question that we political scientists have to tackle. That's it. Thank you very much. I hope this was within 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to make a correction. I was told that, uh, you know, we, we haven't seen each other for two years, but I was told that uh, she made it as a full professor already at the Sisha University. So congratulations belatedly Thank uh, you. for Suzuki. So at this point, I'll be presenting my own paper um, entitled uh, Hard and Soft, Partial and Broad Lockdowns and Their Impact in Southeast Asia. Um, with, I couldn't find 
All right. <clears throat> huh? All right. So, uh, okay, let me begin. It seemed to, excuse me. All right, uh, many governments have throughout the world have placed their countries or parts of their countries on lockdown uh, in order to contain the spread of the virus. Uh, but there were differences in approach. Some like Japan and Sweden um, observed a soft, laissez-faire approach in contrast to others that uh, relied heavily on their uniform personnel for enforcement. Uh, differences in lockdown characteristics could also be found in Southeast Asia. Hence my paper uh, will attempt to explain how such differences impacted on COVID-19 mortality and morbidity, as well as economic growth. I take uh, the cases, I take three cases, Thailand, Indonesia, and the Philippines, in order to generate you know, hypothesis regarding uh, public health crisis management um, and on the wisdom of adopting certain types of lockdown. Eventually, uh, my study, you know, if I'm able to complete it, seeks to inform somehow policymakers regarding the implications of the different types of lockdowns and the trade off that their choice of lockdown entails. I argue that a hard, broad, and extended lockdown is not necessary if, in the first instance, the crisis management response, especially contact tracing, you know, testing, you know, isolation, and uh, more localized lockdowns you know, were timely and um, adequate. So there's, as experience, we can categorize the different types of lockdown you know, in terms of capacity, uh, wait a minute. In terms of intensity, scope, and duration. In terms of intensity, we've got uh, soft and hard lockdowns uh, where we find uh, mild restrictions to bans on uh, public transportation and travel, public gatherings, you know, going out of the house, uh, stoppage of work and businesses, the involvement of the police and military, light or heavy, and uh, less fair or coercive um, enforcement. Now, in terms of scope, we've got partial or broad, and, uh, does it have to be it's easily understood? You know? And duration, you know, we've got short and long uh, lockdowns. I arbitrarily chose two weeks or less for short and uh, longer than two weeks, that could be long. So I use this uh, framework uh, to explain, sorry, to explain how different crisis management responses affect uh, outcomes of morbidity, and economic growth. At the heart of, these, uh, of the framework is the epidemic control performance, which determines uh, morbidity and mortality rates, more or less, and partly economic growth. And in turn, epidemic control performance would depend on the adequacy and timing 
of the emergency or crisis management response. And of course, you know, if it's late, the number of infections would tend uh, to overwhelm the existing public health uh, system, regardless of its strength. And also late responses you know, would make uh, urgent a hard and broad lockdown because of the sheer number of um, infected cases. Uh, the emergency crisis management response, of course, would depend on your, you know, as we, as we uh, you know, uh, apply certain public policy concepts, on your crisis management response design, as well as preparation. And there are three, the choice of lockdown, your epidemic control measures, uh, specific, specially contact tracing, testing, quarantine, um, sorry, I, I placed testing twice, and other um, health protocols. And of course, you've got your public health system's capacity there. So, so it's a kind of more, to my mind, a more holistic uh, way of looking at um, outcomes and uh, the, your policy mix. So just going to the uh, quickly to the findings, uh, you know, in summarizing these findings, we can first look at the outcomes uh, of the COVID-19 responses in the three countries. You know, Thailand has low morbidity, mortality, but also experienced severe economic impact. I think the GDP went down by uh, or contracted by negative 6.5. Indonesia has the highest in the region in terms of morbidity and mortality, but experienced less severe economic contraction. Um, last year, GDP growth contracted by about negative 2.2, and the Philippines has the highest economic contraction at negative 9.5, and is next to Indonesia in mortality and morbidity in the region. So here's a table that would show, you know, the, uh, it provides a summary of the types of lockdown, the, the duration, the, uh, the strength or capacity of the public health system, uh, the timeliness and adequacy of the response and the uh, number of cases and deaths and uh, your uh, GDP growth last year. So we can say that Thailand, just like the Philippines, instituted a long, hard and broad lockdown, but, uh, you know, and they also shared, you know, uh, the same experience of a long lockdown, but the Philippines was longer. In Indonesia, because the government did not uh, uh, declare a national lockdown similar to the Philippines and Thailand, it was the LGU, you know, in coordination with the Ministry of Health that would impose lockdowns, but uh, usually you know, the lockdowns are very short with the exception of certain areas or regional regions that have um, high uh, cases, number of cases. Only Thailand among the three countries had a strong um, public health system, you know, and only Thailand you know, adequately responded to the pandemic, even if it, the response was late, you know, uh, March 25, I believe. And, um, and so, sorry. So these are the figures for the uh, uh, number of cases, you know, confirmed cases and deaths as of the end of 2020 and also the GDP economic growth. So, so as I mentioned, Thailand and the Philippines shared you know, a, um, a similar lockdown experience, which of course adversely affected the economy. Uh, but note that the first quarter, um, the first quarter, um, uh, I mean, the first semester figures of the quarter to quarter 
GDP change, you know, uh, you'll, you'll see that the uh, figure suggests that the hard and broad lockdown you know, uh, had the most severe impact on the economy. So we're talking about, uh, for instance, here in Thailand, negative 9.4 and negative 1.7 in the first quarter. Now, Indonesia also had uh, a high contraction in GDP during the second quarter, but the Philippines had the biggest, no? negative 15.2 in the second quarter and negative 5.1 in the first quarter. But during the second semester, the, somehow you know, the economies were recovering as the uh, uh, lockdown measures or as the lockdown uh, was being eased. No. Um, Thailand has low morbidity and mortality, the, but the Philippines has a high number of cases and deaths. And uh, the difference you know, appears to lie in the adequacy of Thailand's epidemic control measures, uh, specifically contact tracing, testing, and quarantine, as well as the strong um, public health system which in conjunction with the lockdown worked, you no? Know? And when we say worked, Thailand was able to flatten the curve during the lockdown period. You know? So, uh, Indonesia and the Philippines shared similar outcome or experience of having high morbidity and mortality you know, due to the late and inadequate crisis management response and the weak health system capacities. Um, difference in economic performance is suggested by the harsh, broad and extended lockdown in the Philippines, which incapacitated more than 80% of domestic output for more than two months, you know, 76 days at least, while Indonesia only had partial LGU-based uh, lockdowns. So in conclusion, uh, lockdowns involve a trade-off you know, between containing the epidemic, the spread of the virus, and growing the economy. They are not bad per, per se. In fact, they are necessary if conditions warrant. However, my initial findings question the benefits of a hard, broad, and extended lockdown. As the Philippine case suggests, there are other variables crucial to epidemic containment and economic growth in the context of the pandemic. Uh, epidemic control capabilities uh, especially, you know, as we mentioned, contact tracing, testing, and isolation. You know, the strength of the public health system, as well as the timing and crisis and quality of crisis management decisions and enforcement matter. The speed and adequacy of the initial crisis management response is crucial. So a hard and broad um, hard and broad ex and extended lockdown does not automatically translate to lower COVID-19 morbidity and mortality rates as we have, our, as our experience have shown, it may be unnecessary even uh, if the initial crisis management response were successful. So, <clears throat> So my final slide, uh, limitations and suggestions for further study. So the analysis here did not include the effects of reduced international trade on economic growth. Therefore, the findings on the economic impact of lockdowns are only suggestive, no, not definitive. Uh, due to data and time constraints, I was able to co cover only three cases in Southeast Asia. I wanted to cover Vietnam, and that is a suggestion for further study. Why Vietnam? Because the country represents 
you know, a case where uh, low morbidity and mortality was experienced, as well as positive economic growth in 2020. I believe, it, of course, it, the economy was um, was affected, you no, know, but the Vietnam continued to grow at the rate of 2.2% last year. So that ends my presentation. Uh, thank you. Um, we now go to the next presentation uh, to be made by Dr. JJ Joaquin. JJ, take it away. Thanks, Sir Eric. Okay, so this one is a collaborative effort with Professor Adora Ternero, Michelle Santa Romana, and Kevin Aho Ajo ah Agoho. So we changed our title to, to a modeled looking glass, and you'll see why later in the next slide. So we're concerned about the policy logic of the Philippine government's COVID-19 response. So we got the idea from the title from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And if you read the passage here, it tells you how the Philippines COVID response, policy response is all about. Now in this talk, I'll just divide the, the presentation into, two, into four parts. So I'll talk about the project, what's the project all about, the mechanism or the frameworks that we have used in analyzing our data, that is the IATF COVID-19 policies and a bit of discussion of the results of the paper. So what's the project all about? Well, the project's about COVID-19 pandemic, which has been uh, with us for a year now. Actually, it's the anniversary of the lockdown of De La Salle University. So happy anniversary. We're staying at home. Our main focus will be the government's, uh, the Philippine government's response, which is uh, found in the IATF or the Interagency Task Force in, on Emerging Infectious Diseases, the, poli the publicly available uh, policies that they have made. Our main aim in this study is to examine the internal logic of the IATF's COVID-19 policy decision-making. So what we're after is not the policy itself, but the manner by which they arrived at those policies. Now we have two theses in the, uh, in the paper, in the manuscript. So we have a negative thesis that tells us that standard rational models of policy decision-making are insufficient to coherently explain the IATF's internal logic. So that's a negative thesis. And we have a positive thesis that the internal logic of the IATF might be best explained by irrational models. Now I'll tell you something about what rational models are and what irrational models are. Now the main evidence that we have here are the sharp turns, reversals, and seeming inconsistencies in the IATF's publicly available policy. Now, so what are the frameworks that we're using? So we're, we're talking about two kinds of models of decision making. Now, the idea came from uh, an analogy in philosophy of science, which talks about the status of scientific rationality or how to model theory choice in science. So there are not rational models like the logical empiricist verificationist criterion or Karl Popper's uh, fal falsificationist criterion. And there are so-called irrationalist models or irrational models uh, using uh, Thomas Kuhn's idea of paradigm shift, Paul Thayer Abbott's anything goes mentality, Lakatosh's research program, and the SES movement's uh, idea of sociology of science. Now, the labels rational and irrational models are adopted from one great philosopher of science, uh, David Silk, in his book, Anything Goes, published in 1998. Now, if we translate these models in terms of policy decision making, we'll have these definitions. So we take rational models of decision policy decision making as implying some reasonable criteria for policy choice be it in terms of theoretical virtues like conceptual parsimony and expansive explanatory power or practical virtues like uh, viability and cost effectiveness. Now examples of this are present in the literature of public policies. Um, you have the comprehensive model and the incremental model. So the comprehensive model uh, 
works this way. So a problem, a social problem is carefully studied and analyzed. A policy, policy objective is stipulated and logically sound and evidence-based policy alternatives are explored and considered. And the best policy option uh, is decided according to predetermined criteria of effectiveness. On the other hand, on the incremental model, policymakers build on existing policies. Incremental changes are made given still judge according to some logical criteria of effectiveness. Again, the theoretical virtues or the practical virtues of the given policy. Now, on the other hand, you have irrational models of policies. So here, the idea is that mostly subjective criteria like political power play, uh, fluid political affiliations, and an anything goes mindset. So examples of this will be the government power politics model and the garbage can model. So the government power politics model will look like this. So policies result from various bargaining games among players in the national government, and they depend on who is allied with whom, which players are seen early on as deviant or as an outsider in the game, which players have the most influence, and what roles leaders play, or where he stands, which opinions emerges, uh, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, the garbage can irrational model will tell us that policies are grounded on ill-defined and inconsistent preferential agendas of policymakers. They work on a trial and error basis and are based on the available past experiences of these policymakers. Now, they vary, these policies vary based on whoever is calling the shots, who's the winner of the day, or uh, the, who decides given the problem of the day and so on and so forth. Now, we, we use these uh, two models, the rational logic, the internal logic going on in the IATF's COVID-19 policies. And here are some. So we're limiting our discussion in the March 2020 to February 2021 policies. Uh, spelled out in the We Recover as One project uh, in published last May. So here are some general hand-waving uh, observations about this. If you want to get into the details, I'll, I'll get send you the full paper after. So first observation is that there's a repertoire of quality classifications. And every week since March 2020, these classifications have been changing. Right? Uh, some some descriptions are changed over time, some are edited, and so on. So you have the ECQ, MECQ, GCQ, MGCQ, and so on and so forth until you reach the new normal. But if you're following the news and experiencing the lockdowns here in the Philippines, you know that these classifications are malleable and flexible, depending on the week uh, that, uh, oh, who's this? Uh, the speaker, uh, spokesperson, Harry Roque, is uh, he's moved during that week. And there's also a weekly policy balancing act, or monthly, depending on the on the time frame of the of the lockdowns. So there's a, a balancing act between health, public health, on the one hand, economic development, on the other hand, educational, tourism, labor, and so on and so forth. So since March 2020, down here right now, we're still performing these uh, uh, weekly policy balancing act. Now the results will be, of course, we are still uh, having the longest lockdown in the world. Well, at least here in Taft Avenue, Manila, uh, there's a strict lockdown here right now. And over 600,000 total uh, COVID cases, over 12,000 deaths. Uh, economic contraction, high employment, poor online education, etc., etc. Now, a bit of discussion about what's going on here. So, our analysis have shown that there's an unclear and highly fluid kind of policy goals that the IATF is working with, and there seems to be no discernible, accountable leader in that. Um, the agency itself 
And furthermore, a general lack of coordinated strategy within the IATF that consists of senior officials, so department heads, okay, advancing seemingly different agendas and priorities, which we argue is a behavior best explained in terms of players in a political power play game using the irrational models that we have talked about. Now, so conclusion. So a question, we started with the question, is the decision-making behind the IADF's COVID-19 policies rational? Well, if you look back in the models that we have, uh, I have given, uh, the answer is negative because, well, far from it. The IADF's internal logic seems to be best explained in terms of irrational models of policy choice. Like if you consider the garbage can model, anything goes mentality, whoever wins the debate in the IATF meeting for the week will have that policy agenda as our policy, national policy for that week. But there's a hopeful note that the Philippines uh, COVID-19 problems are likely to persist unless the government's policy goals are made clear and agreed upon, and the individual members of the IATF subsume their agenda under an overall objective and coordinate their strategy under an effective leadership, which we still don't have up until now. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. JJ. Uh, let's have the next presentation. Uh, our chair, uh, Dr. Sherwin Ona, will be presenting. No, Dr. Ona, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sir Harry. To the members of this panel, colleagues, and uh, dear participants, pleasant good afternoon to everyone. I will now share my screen and uh, stop my video. Can you now see my screen? All right. I hope you can now see my screen. My paper's yes, title Doc, is... Yes, we can. Po. Okay. Salamat. Thank you for that feedback. The paper's title is Securitizing a Pandemic. This is an exploratory study of uh, the responses of security and law enforcement agencies to our current pandemic and its possible policy implications. So this is the outline of my uh, presentation. Basically, I'm using the lens of securitization and advocating for a desecuritization process from a highly militarized and highly securitized uh, footing into uh, a more normalized, resilient uh, public institutions. I will discuss, of course, the idea of securitization of COVID pandemic and a glimpse of emerging practice, and of course, go into the Philippine experience. Now, the purpose of this, of course, is to examine the response of our, what I term here as SLEPs, no? the security, law enforcement, and public safety agencies. Of course, I will now uh, point to the gaps in our national security agenda and operational policies of selected SLEP agencies. <clears throat> and of course, point out some opportunities for policy development. So I will argue that of course, adopting a highly securitized, highly militarized strategy to a pandemic is not sustainable. And there is a need for us to desecuritize you know, this approach. And we can do this by strengthening, one of the ways of doing this is by strengthening uh, the capabilities, the resiliency of our public institutions, one of which, of course, are our celebs agencies. And of course, this will now open uh, doors for policy opportunities. Of course, with the idea of securitization, um, it traces its roots to the idea to the concept of security studies. And basically, we are based on traditional security threats. Now, it traces its uh, origin back uh, to the Cold War, the rise of NATO and Warsaw Pact, and security there was uh, viewed entirely uh, in the context of traditional threats, the threat of conventional war, the threat of nuclear war, etc. But now that uh, we are 
globally, we are being confronted by traditional as well as non-traditional security threats like pandemics. We're now looking for uh, a new way of looking at securitization, the process of securitization. And of course, going into the very concept of securitization, this allows political actors, political leaders, to brand a crisis event as an existential threat. And the, the reason for this is, of course, to mobilize society, to convince an audience that there is indeed a negative impact or dire security implications of such a threat. Now, and of course, with this branding, with this labeling comes the elevation of the issue in uh, beyond the normal realm of politics, thus requiring extraordinary measures and the breaking of rules, okay? Of course, this seems to be the, the right solution given a pandemic. However, uh, there are some uh, scholars of challenge this belief, you know, and they're saying that, of course, securitization uh, can work initially, but eventually this may lead to a garrison mentality. Uh, using a, a, a purely military uh, uh, military concerns over uh, its civilian aspect, no? or uh, diverting, for instance, resources intended. For instance, in a pandemic, resources intended for health agencies to military organizations. And uh, it can be also pointed out that securitization, highly securitized approach, tends to ignore the human and physiological aspects of a disease, of a pandemic, and merely focuses on the risks and dangers of this threat. Yeah. Thus, the argument that there should be a desecuritization process, the argument that is um, extreme securitization is not sustainable in the long run. And we can see this in uh, the experiences of ASEAN countries or Asia, Asian countries like uh, Thailand, Vietnam, there was some degree of securitization by branding the pandemic as akin to an invasion of war, but immediately they were able to uh, mitigate its effects and avoid prolonged lockdowns. No? So that is the argument for the securitization. Uh, securitization, highly securitized approach, especially in a pandemic environment, uh, may work initially, but in the long run, it will result to abuses. It will result to limited resources, diversion of resources to other means. Okay. And thus the need for desecuritization. Now, as I have said a while ago, in, in uh, countries like Israel, Vietnam, and Thailand, we can see or we've seen uh, some evidence of securitization, lockdowns, some of it national, some of it limited, travel bans, the mobilization of their armies. Number one, no? this is very evident in the case of Israel, Vietnam, and Thailand, where in um, their armies, especially their military reserves were mobilized no? to control their population and to conduct contact tracing in, in some cases. You know? Uh, citizens, because of its uh, because of uncertainties, were highly receptive to the idea of emergency power. No? But of course, uh, in the case of Israel, for instance, and even in Thailand, uh, critics were were quick to point out that, uh, of course, this type of emergency rule has the potential of uh, leading to abuses and even uh, corruption. Of course, we have seen, as I've termed, a moderately securitized approach in the cases of Taiwan and South Korea where both countries manage to avoid prolonged lockdowns. That's why I, I, uh, I term them as moderately securitized because their governments um, <clears throat> mobilize their whole society, their military, but for a short period of time only, okay? Now in the Philippines, you all know the story, uh, uh, the presenters that uh, uh, went ahead of me uh, clearly stated that in the Philippines, uh, our government adopted, a high, in my term, adopted a highly securitized response. As, as you will note, of course, our president has this penchant of, you know, securitizing many issues, you know, 
as in fact uh, early in his term he declared a national state of lawlessness or emergency in the pa and uh, of course uh, covid is uh, not different from this no in many of his speeches he presented covid-19 as an invisible enemy and that uh, declaring uh, yeah, our response as a war like no war like response and of course by uh, march 16 if you still remember uh, this led uh, our government to declare a state of calamity and uh, resulting into a, a total lockdown of uh, the national capital region and uh, cebu of course uh, for our security and law enforcement public safety agencies the government immediately uh, uh, organized what they call a national joint task force covid shield this uh, joint task force was composed of uh, units from the armed forces the police the philippine coast guard and the bureau of fire now and of course uh, the enactment of emergency power no, through the bayanihan act so highly securitized po yung response ng government natin well what are what we see as challenges and gaps especially in terms of national security policy this slide will show you that in terms of our national security agenda and national security strategy these two documents 2017 to 2022 are more focused on traditional threats no uh, if you read these documents the the main concerns here are uh, external defense issues no for instance our concern in uh, the west philippine sea internal conflict our uh, existing uh, prolonged conflict with the uh, communist insurgents and of course terrorism uh, if you look at health emergencies if you look at pandemics in particular in the national security agency i believe it's just one uh, national security agenda it was mentioned in one or two sentences only now in the national security strategy it's a 160 page strategy document it's just one it's just one uh, uh, one paragraph okay so we we can say that we were really blindsided when it comes to our security response to a pandemic no? um sadly to say uh, our security agencies in particular uh, the armed forces for instance most of our doctrines are geared towards calamity induced disasters no? in fact in the armed forces we have what we call a doctrine called the uh, human humanitarian assistance and disaster response okay so hadr now we have this set of uh, of rules rules of engagement mobilization plans concerning hadr but this this kind of doctrine is not geared towards pandemics no? and uh, if you look at the operational level upon the review of the different uh, operation plans of uh, PNP and the Philippine Coast Guard and of course the armed forces as well no the focus during the covid-19 pandemic was more on the mobilization of regular troops and the mobility of these units no we can see for instance the mobilization of lim uh, our limited uh, cargo planes no uh, airlift assets of the Philippine Air Force ships of the navy Uh, of course mobilization of our medical capacities uh, which is of course limited uh, and of course uh, the conversion of combat units to uh, civil military units no from uh, its combat orientation its traditional combat orientation uh, overnight these combat units were uh, transformed into population control units no civil military roles in that, at that of course we look at other practices um in the US and Israel for instance highly integrated uh their reserve forces are highly integrated the national guards uh can be uh, uh can augment law enforcement for instance they have what they call a national stockpile of medical supplies okay and uh, the national guard in the US uh, was uh, mobilized to assist in contact tracing Of course, they have a more mature practice of what we call chemical, biological, and radionuclear units. No, in the Philippines, this type of units are in its infancy, its nascent stages, uh, uh, so far. No? 
So what are our findings no, upon review of uh, existing operational plans and national security documents of the Philippines and of uh, key informant, limited key informants? Um, uh, our key informants reveal that, of course, our SLEPs experience difficulty because they are confronted by multiple threats. No? Our SLEPs are uh, battling, aside from COVID, the renewed government campaign against criminality and its war on drugs. Okay. Uh, you also uh, would remember that uh, during the height of the COVID in a outbreak, uh, we have an emerging problem in uh, at the West Philippine Sea. You know? uh, incursions made by uh, uh, foreign vessels. Of course, our security agencies complained uh, of uh, limited uh, medical supplies and inadequate personnel. Okay, and they uh, they express their concern about. Uh, doctrinal uncertainties. You know? There is no roadmap really on how to mobilize reserve forces uh, for non-traditional threats. Don't get me wrong, our reserve forces were mobilized, but more on uh, crowd control only, you know, population control. But uh, for the other aspects of the pandemic, uh, that is still a big gap. You know? There is virtually a very uh, no or very limited uh, CBRN response. And uh, there is no guidance on how to treat, for instance, uh, inmates, no? yung person deprived of liberties coming from the IATF. No? Uh, our informants from the Philippine Coast Guard reported difficulty uh, in terms of coordinating with local government units and, of course, uh, national government agencies in terms of testing and quarantine procedures. No? And, of course, um, again, our key informants were saying that, you know, we were so focused on the effects on the, of the pandemic, uh, of containing the pandemic, containing the community spread, but uh, we never imagined that this will spawn into new security threats like the increase in cybercrime that we uh, have seen during the first and second phases of the pandemic. You know? And of course, the, it exacerbated existing uh, socioeconomic leverages, no? worsening uh, poverty, hunger and malnutrition. And this has, according to them, an overall effect in the country's peace and border situation. This is just, um, we also looked at uh, the data uh, data management challenges, and I'll just skip this uh, to the interest of time. Uh, so what are the uh, policy opportunities? We're saying that there is a need for the Philippines to re-examine how it views non-traditional threats, uh, especially its characteristics. No. It, we can see now in COVID that it has a multi-dimensional impact. No? It has no working definition of what an enemy is. Okay, who is the enemy? The enemy is not seen. No? And it's very dependent on the labeling of the actor. We are saying that we need more than that. No? Uh, the appreciation of the audience vis-a-vis -vis the citizens is very important when it comes to their role. You know, citizens are not merely recipient of ayuda. No, they have. They should have a role, no? uh, similar to what Vietnam and Thailand did, no? mobilizing their citizens. And of course, in terms of its national uh, security policy, our national security policy, uh, we are advocating for uh, a clearer view, a clearer doctrinal stance when it comes to pandemic health emergency and how it can be categorized as a legitimate security concern. Okay. And of course, uh, of course, uh, we would like to see a redefinition of what a whole of society response is when it comes to these types of threats. Okay, um, now we need to mobilize our society, as we have said, um, because nobody's coming to our aid. No? And because of this, we need to uh, rethink how we define, for instance, our strategic industries, our civil defense structures. No? In our current national security policy, uh, production of uh, PPEs is not considered as a strategic industry, okay? Uh, we have little appreciation of how to use data and information management. Uh, uh, as we can see now, there is a controversy with the Stay Safe uh, contact tracing application. covid Kaya was not operational until uh, the fifth or sixth month of the pandemic. No. Okay. And of course, there is a need to uh, upgrade the capabilities of our SLEP agencies.
what are the next steps? Of course, this is a work in progress study. We intend to conduct more KIIs and uh, validation with a group of BNP officers. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rona. Uh, we'll move quickly. We don't have much time anymore. Um, we hope we have 20 minutes left. So if we could, uh, sorry to the two other panel members, but uh, we're constrained to 10 minutes. So Dr. Magno, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Batalia. And uh, thank you also for organizing this uh, panel. So my uh, topic is co-production mechanisms in pandemic governance using the framework uh, theory of uh, Eleanor Ostrom. Co-production is the process through which inputs used to produce a good or service are contributed by individuals who are not in the same organization. Whether the regular producer is the only producer depends both on the nature of the good or service itself and on the incentives that encourage the active participation of others. Co-production implies that citizens, civil society, and the private sector can play an active role in producing public goods and services of consequence to them. So the research problem is, is that the COVID-19 crisis I characterize as a wicked problem requiring a coordinated approach. It's wicked because it doesn't go away, or if it goes away, it takes some time. The study considered how horizontal and vertical collaboration across public authorities and their co-production with stakeholders fueled collective action to combat the disease. It probed into the conditions that led to the co-production of governance responses to the dilemmas brought about by the pandemic. So this is the framework that I developed uh, using uh, the co-production theory of Eleanor Ostrom. So basically uh, citizens participate in the production of public goods, something of public value. And this is seen in uh, pandemic governance as I will show uh, certain examples uh, using a whole of government approach. And of course, this is a challenge in itself for the government. Uh, interoperability is needed. And uh, for a whole of society approach to work, uh, there are networks of uh, civil society, private sector, academe, and uh, citizen volunteers uh, participating in co-production mechanisms. So you have a whole of government and a whole of society approach. Local governments are part of a, a whole of government approach. And uh, these mechanisms contribute to the production, co-production of programs, activities, and projects with the outcome being uh, preventing COVID-19 transmission. So in decentralized governance, the pandemic provided opportunities for innovative LGU chief executives to shine. Collaborative linkages were forged by LGUs with the private sector, civil society and academic to co-produce COVID-19 response efforts. The policy support and institutional incentives for co-production are provided by existing laws, such as the Local Government Code and the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act. That's why in the state of public health emergency uh, uh, last year, uh, President uh, Duterte mentioned that LGUs uh, should reconstitute their local disaster risk reduction management councils and utilize the quick response funds. Of course, uh, there is another governance mechanism established. The uh, So you can see here the DILG directing Metro Manila LGUs to activate local COVID-19 task forces. The local COVID-19 task force is a mirror image of the national a COVID-19 task force. So this uh, converges with existing uh, uh, local special bodies like lo local disaster risk reduction management councils. So use a process tracing method. This is a qualitative study. As uh, David Collier pointed out, the descriptive component of process, process tracing begins not with observing change or sequence, but rather with taking good snapshots at a series of specific Moment. So now I'll provide you with snapshots, or be, before that, let me just uh, indicate here the snapshots that I uh, observe. Uh, 
indicating agreements among government and societal stakeholders to cop reduce inputs as part of COVID-19 response efforts. These include the manufacturing of face masks and personal protective equipment, especially in the early part of the pandemic where there is a palpable uh, shortage in this, uh, uh, in this health uh, equipments. The delivery of food packs for low income communities provision of shelters and transportation of poor medical frontliners, establishment of quarantine facilities and testing centers, parental participation in homeschooling programs and tripartite agreements in vaccination rollout. So these are snapshots of fashion designers stepping up to fill need for protective suits for COVID-19 frontliners. You have Project Ugnayan uh, providing food packs amounting to or reaching 7.6 million people. Project Ugnayan is a initiative of uh, business groups. So you're familiar with uh, our university opening its doors to Hospital ng Manila medical frontliners at a time when there are uh, transport mobility restrictions. So our campus uh, was open for medical frontliners to uh, take, uh, take a rest. And uh, in the case of San, San Juan City, they converted school to a uh, quarantine facility with the support of uh, Saber School with their uh, alumni who are doctors and they also provided beds and other medical equipments. In the case of Pasig, uh, they provided the uh, Libreng Saka using, uh, using uh, applications, digital applications. Uh, Marikina City uh, uh, established a testing lab. Uh, of course, there were challenges at the start, but uh, this is precisely uh, the nature of co-production. You have uh, LGUs co-producing uh, testing labs and these things do not happen under different conditions. Valenzuela City uh, also coming up with uh, testing uh, activities in partnership with Medical City and Brigada Escuela evolving under pandemic times. So Brigada Escuela became a mechanism whereby they, uh, they provided support for home-based learning to parents. So uh, the final snapshot is the vaccine rollout. Uh, at the start, there, were, uh, there was hesitancy on the part of uh, the central government to enable or to allow a non-central government player. So eventually they allowed tripartite agreements and this started really with the private sector uh, negotiating a tripartite deal with the manufacturer AstraZeneca together with the national government. And uh, eventually local government units uh, after the private sector uh, provided the model, local government units uh, started uh, their agreements with AstraZeneca. So yeah, you have Makati, Manila, Quezon City, Bacolod, Valenzuela, Caloocan. This is just a list of uh, 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 local government units. San Miguel Corporation uh, provided uh, or announced it will allot 1 billion for uh, COVID-19 vaccination of their employees. Lo and behold, you have Makati City saying that they have 1 billion uh, uh, budget for, uh, for vaccination. Of course, LGUs are corporate entities. The nice thing about the announcement of uh, Makati City Mayor Binay is that they would also vaccinate those who are not residents, but those who are working in Makati. So 61 Philippine cities are ready to spend over 10 billion pesos for COVID-19 vaccines. So this is more than half of the total cities in the country. For good reason, they have money. And this is because of the internal revenue allotment. And by next year, with the implementation of the Mandanas ruling, they will have more funds. So eventually a COVID-19 vaccination program law has been passed. And just to conclude the co-production uh, to build back better has uh, co-production has to continue uh, beyond the pandemic. Steen and Branson argue, argued that behavioral changes and co-production initiatives will need to continue beyond the peak of the COVID-19 crisis. They pointed out the need for collective action across the state society divide even after the pandemic characterized by the shift from short-term crisis and relief to countering the long-term impact of the pandemic and the well-being of communities. In the case of the Philippines, it is important to identify the institutional mechanisms 
and incentives that will enable the pursuit of co-production initiatives to recover from the COVID-19 devastation and rebuild in a more sustainable manner in the post-pandemic era. We have the seal of good local governance to provide guidance for transparency, participation, and accountability. And moving forward beyond the pandemic, we need to pursue sustainable development goals. So cities, local government units will continue to co-produce for a more sustainable future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go quickly to uh, Dr. Kalimbahin for her presentation. Dr. Kalimbahin. Uh, thank you, Eric, and thank you to the organizers uh, of the DLSU Arts Congress. I am now sharing with you my slide. I'll try to go uh, very quickly. Okay, so um, my research on election administration in the last 18 years has led me to trace and examine the capacity of our election management body over time. But uh, like you, the election is the last thing on my mind right now. Foremost in our minds is the virus, the surge, the vaccine. But we still need to rethink and reform elections during a health crisis. Election management bodies need to be ready to practice protocols and election preparedness in an emergency. The Commission on Election needs to move past this as a one-off emergency health crisis. We have heard and that this might not be the last pandemic in our lifetime. Elections need to be reimagined at the manual component and digital level. Comelec and other stakeholders can use this 2022 election under COVID as an opportunity both to rethink and reform elections and in the process strengthen the Electoral Commission for future election cycles. Elections are central in a state like the Philippines. We know it remains a major avenue to private accumulation. We know that access to the state apparatus can mean rent-seeking opportunities. The stakes are high in an election in the Philippines with or without the pandemic. So let's begin with some general concepts. Within the discipline, there's so much distinction between the electoral process and the electoral outcomes. Election administration is a yawn-worthy topic among political scientists. Yet the electoral process can in fact affect electoral outcomes. Election administration has an impact on voter behavior and in turn on the outcomes. So, so the pandemic is a challenge to election administration. Precautions will have to be taken for safe in-person voting. The, ele the election cycle all throughout involves a lot of human interaction. So there are two issues that need to be addressed, the health and safety and also voter turnout. So we, in holding elections in a pandemic, there are two possible scenarios facing the COMELEC and, if the, and the public if elections are held without ample preparation. One, the election might become a virus super spreader. And two, there will be a low voter turnout that can raise legitimate, legitimacy issues post-election. Even without the pandemic, voting can already be tedious and can be a testing exercise in our country. You have slight, slight technical glitches, change in rules, and all these can cause delays that can result in congestion of people and confusion, which can disenfranchise some voters or dissuade voters from going to the polls. Earlier, I mentioned that election administration affects voter behavior and election outcomes. Election day lines, voter registration, accuracy of voter data are issues that cannot be brushed aside. These are not minor impediments to citizen participation. And it would be unfair to use this as a gauge of a citizen's commitment to participate in a democracy. The electoral experience is the responsibility of election management bodies. Empirical literature showed that voters may be dissuaded from voting by small costs, such as long lines and congestion. In a pandemic, that is not even a small cost. Moving to the Philippine case, the centrality of elections puts the spotlight on the Commission on Elections, tasked with delivering fair democratic outcomes to both voters and candidates. And while the COMELEC was vested with independence and autonomy as a constitutional commission, it was not empowered to realistically deliver its mandate. Over time, this has been the case. 
So what is the COMLEC up against in the 2022 elections? As you can see, with or without the pandemic, this is a lot. You're looking at national, presidential, local, the barn, barangay in December, more than 18,000 national and local posts, 63 million voters expected, 14% of which are senior citizens. Okay, And the voter turnout the last election was 75%. You're looking at 85,000 clustered precincts and almost half a million uh, personnel. So historical process tracing shows evidence of the COMLEX suffering from forms of state capture and capacity issues. With the health emergency under COVID, protocols add an unexpected layer of procedures that constrain an already weak administrative capacity of a constitutional commission. The, con the commission continues to be dragged by capacity issues. Previous recommendations of institutional reform have been in fact recognized by the commission, but it has not had any major strategic and modernization reform program. Unlike the Commission on Audit and Civil Service Commission, the election management body has not had any reorganization after 1986. The COMELEC likes to describe, describe itself as a crisis manager and to their credit, yes, they are. But its goal settings do not go beyond three years. It's just enough to make it to each election cycle. The commission has some difficulty working seamlessly with other agencies due to its isolation thinking and inertia issues. At the moment, we are seeing low re registration, which could mean low voter turnout. This should not come as a surprise. The Philippines has one of the longest and strictest lo lockdowns since the pandemic began. You and I have been conditioned to think that staying indoors is the best way to prevent spreading and getting the virus. We must keep that in mind because it will have an impact on voter turnout. To some extent, voter turnout will also be, be dependent on the timing, effective and equitable distribution of vaccine in the country. Now, these are early evidence of capacity concerns and election preparedness. So the Palawan plebiscite serves as a pilot for the commission. This will happen on Saturday. Here's what we know so far. Regarding facilities at the polling stations that can secure voter safety in Palawan plebiscite, the plan is to limit to five vo voters per precinct. It's not yet certain where the rest will wait. In terms of adequate infrastructure to accommodate the spacing of voters, the Palawan plebiscite plan is to use isolation polling precinct. So if a voter comes with symptoms of COVID, they will be, they will be ushered to another area where they can vote. Um, and, I'm still not sure what the, the safety features will be for that. Um, in terms of adequate number of uh, poll workers, the Palawan plebiscite plan is to limit the number of poll watchers. On the proper training for poll workers under new conditions, we were told the guidelines will come out in the fourth quarter of 2021. On the reliability of vote counting machines, we know that uh, refurbished vote counting machines will be used. And on the adequate budget provisions for additional election materials, we know that the proposed budget was actually cut in half. So COMELEC prides itself as, a crisis, as crisis managers. And like I said, they are, but they are untested in a health emergency, unlike in other countries where they had emergencies and held elections. I think there are some things that we are also not talking enough about in a realistic way in this country. This is a conversation that should be initiated by an election management body. Alternative election arrangements. Alternative election arrangements that we can apply, perhaps not in this election cycle, but in the next. It will require adequate budget provisions to, uh, to pursue these uh, alternative arrangements. So what is the experience in other countries? In 2020, 60 countries postponed elections and 13 countries did go ahead with election with varying successes. The most successful will include South Korea and New Zealand, and despite the hitches, the June 2020 election in Malawi. All were perceived as credible and fair elections. In fact, Malawi is the only country that moved up in the Freedom House Index last year. Now, South Korea and New Zealand are stable democracies, but also countries that successfully contained or controlled their COVID infection rates. These two countries entered into the election with a lot of confidence on the part of voters on how government decisively addressed the infection rate through testing, effective contact, contact tracing, and isolation. South Korea is in fact labeled as the country that has learned how to live with COVID. 
According to election health, uh, oh, sorry, according to election observers and health officials, the elections held in 2020 managed to decrease the risk of transmission in polling places when officials successfully enforced health protocols such as physical distance, providing masks, increased ventilation, uh, and the polling precincts were constantly sanitized uh, uh, throughout the election period. Another mitigating factor was in providing remote options for voters to help minimize congestion. These are the alternative election arrangements I mentioned earlier. So in other countries, these are the modalities of voting by mail. Will it be a universal vote by mail, meaning voters automatically receive the ballot? Will it be a requested application for absentee voting? So the options are all voters receive application, or you have a system of no excuse application, or you have a COVID-19 concern permitted to request an application. Uh, sorry. In completing a mail ballot, the options are, will there be a witness signature or no witness signature? Notarized or not notarized? Will the ballot come with a copy of the ID or not? In submitting a mail ballot, the options are, will the ballot be accepted uh, postmark election day and received within however many days? In terms of channels of ballot submission, the options are drop off boxes, mail, and in person channels. As you can see, this is not as simple uh, as we like to talk about it. You know, let's have mail in voting. But it is difficult, yes, but we cannot dismiss this. We need to start talking about this. The experience of the, of the US, um, when it comes to election fraud issues raised in 2020 elections, there was a lot of talk about vote padding in, in the mail in voting, but actually there was a high number of rejected ballots rather than vote padding. These were rejected because it was late, the ballot lacked the signature, it lacks a second signature from a witness, it lacked the address of the witness, uh, when there's a matching signature process involved, one record uh, didn't match, so it would have to be rejected. And then there's a back and forth between election administrators and the voters to clarify that, that signature. In fact, in the 2020 primaries, almost half a million votes were rejected, even as they were registered voters. In the 2016 elections, almost 300,000 mail-in votes were rejected. This does not include or account for those mail-in ballots that were lost. And all this is conducted under credible election officials, transparent process. They have CCTV cameras in each of the process and procedure. Once the mail-in ballots come, there's also a la several layers of audit along the way. And in the US, in, it was in fact the younger voters, the overseas voters, and the first time absentee voters that had a higher tendency to have votes rejected. Again, it's not as simple as it as it sounds. So in terms of our election preparedness, uh, online registration is not actually fully online. And the Philippine Post has weighed in to say they can help uh, because they will be digital by this year. But they will need guidelines from the election management body. And for sure, they will also need a learning curve in how they will use their own digital platform. We have to see how the Comelec pilots um, uh, plow and plebiscite go on Saturday. So uh, this is my last slide. Long COVID is when those who got the virus experience the symptoms longer. The weakness, the fatigue, it lingers. Capacity issues of COMELEC linger. For as long as the capacity of COMELEC to be an independent body is not addressed, the possibility of capture likewise lingers. The autonomy of the COMELEC is undermined by lack of resources to strategically reorganize, modernize, just like the other constitutional commissions have. We need to hold regular free and fair elections as a democracy, but we also need to rethink and reform elections for 2022 and for future election cycles. Democracy, after all, is a painful process of proceduralism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kalimbahin. Um, thank you to the panel members. Um, can we give them a round of applause, please? So on behalf of the panel, I'd like to thank uh, those who generally, generously uh, gave their time to attend the, uh, this uh, panel. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all the participants and for the Arts Congress for organizing uh, this panel. Uh, we cannot entertain um, 
any questions anymore, but it would be wise if you are interested, you could just simply send a correspondence no, to the uh, panel member concerned. So on behalf of the panel and Arts Congress, uh, thank you and good afternoon to everyone. Josh? Thank you, Dr. Bataria. Uh, before we end, I would like to invite everyone to participate in the remaining activities of the 14th DLSU Arts Congress. At 4.15, the pre-recorded parallel session two videos will be available on YouTube. With that, we now end this afternoon's plenary session. We would like to thank our speakers for today, namely Dr. Ayami Suzuki of Doshisha University, Dr. Serwin Ona, Dr. Francisco Magno, Dr. Cleo Kalimbahin, Dr. Ador Torneo, Dr. Kevin Nielsen Agoho, Dr. Michelle Santa Romana from the Political Science Department, and Dr. Jeremiah Jovin Joaquin from the Philosophy Department. Many thanks as well to Dr. Eric Vincent Pataglia for moderating this afternoon session. And thank you, our dear participants. Thank you very much as well, and see you in this afternoon's activities. Animo Lasal. Thank you, Joshua.